Section 9 of Mr. Fortune's Practice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Mr. Fortune's Practice by H. C. Bailey. The Unknown Murderer, Part 1. Once upon a time, a number of men in a club discussed how Mr. Reginald Fortune came to be the expert adviser of the Home Office upon crime. The doctors admitted that though he is a competent surgeon, pathologist, and what not, he never showed international form. There was a fellow of the Royal Society who urged that Fortune knew more about natural science than most schoolboys, politicians, and civil servants. An artist said he had been told Fortune understood business, and his banker believed Fortune was a judge of old furniture. But they all agreed that he is a jolly good fellow, which means, being interpreted, he can be all things to all men. Mr. Fortune himself is convinced that he was meant by Providence to be a general practitioner, to attend to my lumbago and your daughter's measles. He has been heard to complain of the chance that has made him, knowing something of everything, nothing completely, into a specialist. His only qualification, he will tell you, is that he doesn't get muddled. There you have it, then. He is singularly sensitive to people. Very odd how he knows men, said Superintendent Bell reverently, as if he had an extra sense to tell him of people's souls, like smells or colors and he has a clear head. He is never confused about what is important and what isn't, and he has never been known to hesitate in doing what is necessary. Consider his dealing with the affair of the unknown murderer. There was not much interesting crime that Christmas. The singular case of Sir Humphrey Bigod, who was found dead in a chalk pit on the eve of his marriage, therefore obtained a lot of space in the papers, which kept it up even after the coroner's jury had declared for death by misadventure, with irrelevant inventions and bloodthirsty hints of murder and tales of clues. This did not disturb the peace of the scientific adviser to the criminal investigation department, who knew that the lad was killed by a fall and that there was no means of knowing any more. Mr. Fortune was much occupied in being happy, for after a long endeavor he had engaged Joan Amber to marry him. The lady has said the endeavor was hers, but I am not now telling that story. Just after Christmas she took him to the children's party at the home of help. It is an old-fashioned orphanage, a huge barrack of a building, but homely and kind. Time out of mind, people of all sorts, with old titles and new, with money and with brains, have been friends of its children. When Miss Amber brought Reggie Fortune under the flags and strings of paper roses into its hall, which was as noisy as the parrot house, he gasped slightly. Be brave, child, she said. This is quiet to what it will be after tea, and cool. You will be much hotter. You don't know how hot you'll be. "'Woman, you have deceived me,' said Mr. Fortune bitterly. "'I thought philanthropists were respectable.' "'Yes, dear, don't be frightened. "'You're only a philanthropist for the afternoon.' "'I ask you, is that Crab Warnham?' "'Of course it's Captain Warnham.' Miss Amber smiled beautifully at a gaunt man with a face like an old jockey. He flushed as he leered back. "'Do you know his wife? She's rather precious.' "'Poor woman.' He doesn't look comfortable here, does he? The last time I saw Crab Warnham was in a place that's several kinds of hell in Berlin. He was quite at home there. Forget it, said Miss Amber gently. You will when you meet his wife, and their boy's a darling. His boy? Reggie was startled. Oh, no, she was a widow. He worships her and the child. Reggie said nothing. It appeared to him that Captain Warnham for a man who worshipped his wife had a hungry eye on women. And the next moment Captain Warnham was called to attention. A small woman, still pretty, though earnest, 
talked to him like a mother or a commanding officer. He was embarrassed, and when she had done with him, he fled. The small woman, who was austerely but daintily clad in black, with some white at the neck, continued to flit amongst the company, finding everyone a job of work. She says to one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and who is she, Joan? Lady Chantry, said Miss Amber, she's Providence here, you know. And Lady Chantry was upon them. Reggie found himself looking down into a pair of uncommonly bright eyes, and wondering what it felt like to be as strenuous as the little woman who was congratulating him on Joan, thanking him for being there, and arranging his afternoon for him all in one breath. He had never heard anyone talk so fast. In a condition of stupor he saw Joan reft from him to tell the story of Cinderella to magic lantern pictures in one dormitory, while he was led to another to help in a scratch concert. And as the door closed on him he heard the swift, clear voice of Lady Chantry, exhorting staff and visitors, to play round games. He suffered. People who had no voices sang showy songs. People who had too much voice sang ragtime to those solemn, respectful children. In pity for the children and himself, he set up as a conjurer, and the dormitory was growing merry when a shriek cut into his patter. "'That's only my bones creaking,' he went on quickly, for the children were frightened. "'They always do that when I put the knife in at the ear and take it out of my hind leg. "'So, but it doesn't hurt. "'As the motor-car said when it ran over the policeman's feet, all done by kindness. "'Come here, Jenny Wren. You mustn't use your nose as a money-box.' "'A small person submitted to having pennies taken out of her face.' The door opened, and a pallid nurse said faintly, "'The doctor. Are you the doctor?' "'Of course,' said Reggie. "'One moment, people. Mr. Punch has fallen over the baby. It always hurts him. In the hump. Are we downhearted? No. Pack up your troubles in the old kit bag.' He went out to a joyful roar of that lyric. "'What's the trouble?' The nurse was shaking. "'In there, sir. She's up there.' Reggie went up the stairs in quick time. The door of a little sitting-room stood open. Inside it, people were staring at a woman who sat at her desk. Her dress was dark and wet. Her head lolled forward. A deep gash ran across her throat. "'Yes, there's too many of us here,' he said, and waved the spectators away. One lingered, an old woman, large and imposing, and announced that she was the matron. Reggie shut the door and came back to the body in the chair. He held the limp hands a moment. He lifted the head and looked close into the flaccid face. When was she found? When I heard that scream? Yes. He examined the floor. Quite so. He turned to the matron. Well, well, who is she? It's our resident medical officer, Dr. Emily Hall. But, Dr. Fortune, can't you do anything? "'She's gone,' said Reggie. "'But this is terrible, doctor. What does it mean?' "'Well, I don't know what it means. Her throat was cut by a highly efficient knife, probably from behind. She lingered a little while, quite helpless, and died, not so very long ago. Who screamed? The nurse who found her. One of our own girls, Dr. Fortune, Edith Baker. She was always a favorite of poor Dr. Hall's. She has been kept on here at Dr. Hall's wish to train as a nurse. She was devoted to Dr. Hall, one of these girlish passions. And she came into the room and found this and screamed? So she tells me, said the matron. Well, well, Reggie sighed, poor kiddies, and now you must send for the police. I have given instructions, Dr. Fortune, said the matron with dignity, and I think you ought to keep Edith Baker from talking about it. Reggie opened the door. Edith will not talk, said the matron coldly. She is a very reserved creature. Poor thing, but I'm afraid some of our visitors will, and they had better not, you know. At last he got rid of the lady, and turned the key in the lock, and stood looking at it. Yes, quite natural, but very convenient, said he, and turned away from it, and contemplated a big easy chair. 
the loose cushion on the seat showed that somebody had been sitting in it a fact not in itself remarkable but there was a tiny smear of blood on the arm still wet he picked up the cushion on the under side was a larger smear of blood dr fortune's brow contracted the unknown murderer cuts her throat comes over here makes a mess on the chair turns the cushion over and sits down to watch the woman die this is rather diabolical he began to wander round the room it offered him no other signs but some drops of blood on the hearth-rug and the hearth he knelt down and peered into the fire and with the tongs drew from it a thin piece of metal it was a surgical knife he looked at the dead woman from your hospital equipment dr hall and edith baker is a nurse and edith baker had a girlish passion for you i wonder someone was trying the door he unlocked it to find an inspector of police i am reginald fortune he explained here's your case i've heard of you sir said the inspector reverently bad business isn't it i'm sure it's very lucky you were here i wonder reggie murmured could it be suicide sir reggie shook his head i wish it could not a nice murder not at all a nice murder by the way there's the knife i picked it out of the fire doctor's tool isn't it sir have you got any theory about it reggie shook his head there's the girl who gave the alarm she's a nurse in the hospital i'm told i don't know the girl said reggie you'd better see what you make of the room i shall be downstairs in the big hall the decorations and the christmas tree with its ungiven presence glowed to emptiness and silence joan amber came forward to meet him he did not speak to her he continued to stare at the ungiven presence on the christmas tree what do you want to do she said at last this is the end of a perfect day said mr fortune poor kiddies the matron packed them all off to their dormitories mr fortune laughed just as well to rub it in isn't it miss amber did not answer him for a moment do you know you look rather terrible she said and indeed his normally plump fresh-coloured cheery face had a certain ferocity i feel like a fool joan where is everybody she sent everybody away too she would great organizer no brain my only aunt a woman's murdered and every stranger who was in the place is hustled off before the police get to work this isn't a crime it's a nightmare well of course they were anxious to go they would be reggie who are you thinking of i can't think there are no facts where's this matron now the inspector came upon them as they were going to her room i finished upstairs sir not much for me is there plenty downstairs though i reckon i'll hear some queer stories before i've done these homes are always full of gossip people living too close together wonderful what bad blood it makes i he broke off and stared at reggie from the matron's room came the sound of sobbing he opened the door without a knock the matron sat at her writing-table coldly judicial a girl in nurse's uniform was crying on the bosom of lady chantry who caressed her and murmured in her ear sorry to interrupt ma'am the inspector said staring hard you don't interrupt this girl is edith baker who seems to have been the last person who saw dr hall alive and was certainly the first person who saw her dead and who was very very fond of her lady chantry said gently weren't you dear i'll have to take her statement said the inspector but the girl was torn with sobbing come dear come lady chantry strove with her the inspector only wants you to say how you left her and how you found her edith you must control yourself the matron lifted her voice i hate you the girl cried and tore herself away and rushed out of the room she'll have to speak you know ma'am the inspector said i am very sorry to say she has always had a passionate temperament said the matron poor child lady chantry rose she was so fond of the doctor you see i'll go to her matron and see what i can do 
"'Does anyone here know what the girl was up to this afternoon, ma'am?' said the inspector. "'I will try to find out for you,' said the matron, and rang her bell. "'Well, well,' said Reggie Fortune. "'Every little helps. "'You might find out what all the other people were doing this afternoon.' The matron stared at him. "'Surely you're not thinking of the visitors, Mr. Fortune?' "'I am thinking of your children,' said Reggie, and she was the more amazed. "'Not a nice murder, you know. Not at all a nice murder.' And then he took Miss Amber home. She found him taciturn, which is his habit when he is angry, but she had never seen him angry before. She is a wise woman. When he was leaving her, "'Do you know what it is about you, sir?' she said. "'You're always just right.' When the Honourable Sidney Lomas came to his room in Scotland Yard the next morning, Reggie Fortune was waiting for him. "'My dear fellow,' he protested, "'what is this? You're not really up, are you? It's not eleven. You're an hallucination.' "'Zeal, all zeal, Lomas. The orphanage murder is my trouble. Have you come to give yourself up? I suspected you from the first, Fortune. Where is it?' He took a copy of the Daily Wire from the rack. Yes, Dr. Reginald Fortune, the eminent surgeon, was attending the function and was able to give the police a first-hand account of the crime. Dr. Fortune states that the weapon used was a surgical knife. My dear fellow, the case looks black indeed. Reggie was not amused. Yes, I also was present, and several others, he said. Do you know anything about any of us? Lomas put up his eyeglass. There's a certain bitterness about you, Fortune. This is unusual. What's the matter? I don't like this murder, said Reggie. It spoilt the children's party. That would be a by-product, Lomas agreed. You're getting very domestic in your emotions. Oh, I like it, my dear fellow, but it makes you a little irrelevant. Domestic be damned. I'm highly relevant. It spoilt the children's party. Why did it happen at the children's party? Lots of other nice days to kill the resident medical officer. You're suggesting it was one of the visitors? No, no, it isn't the only day visitors visit. I'm suggesting life is real, life is earnest, and rather diabolical sometimes. I'll call for the reports, Lomas said, and did so. Good gad, reams! Barton's put in some heavy work. I thought he would, said Reggie, and went to read over Lomas's shoulder. At the end, Lomas lay back and looked up at him. Well, Barton's put his money on this young nurse, Edith Baker. Yes, that's the matron's tip. I saw the matron, one of the world's organizers, Lomas, a place for everything and everything in its place. And if you don't fit, God help you. Edith Baker didn't fit. Edith Baker has emotions. Therefore, she does murders, Q.E.D., well, the matron ought to know the girl. She ought, Reggie agreed, and our case is, gentlemen, that the matron who ought to know girls says Edith Baker isn't a nice young person. Lomas, dear, why do policemen always believe what they're told? What the matron don't like isn't evidence. There is some evidence. The girl had one of these hysterical affections for the dead woman, passionately devoted and passionately jealous, and so forth. The girl had access to the hospital instruments. All her time in the afternoon can't be accounted for, and she was the first to know of the murder. It's not good enough, Lomas. Why did she give the alarm? Lomas shrugged. A murderer does now and then, cunning or fright. And why did she wait for the children's party to do the murder? Something may have happened there to rouse her jealousy. "'Something with one of the visitors?' Reggie suggested. "'I wonder.' Then he laughed. "'A party of the visitors went round the hospital, Lomas. "'They had access to the surgical instruments. "'And they were suddenly seized with a desire for homicide. "'They also went to the gymnasium and the kitchen. "'Did any of them start boiling potatoes? "'My dear fortune, you are not as plausible as usual.' "'It isn't plausible,' Reggie said. "'I know that.' It's too damn wicked. Abnormal, Lomas nodded. Of course, the essence of the thing is that it's abnormal. Every once in a while we have these murders in an orphanage or school or some place where women and children are herded together. 
Nine times out of ten they are cases of hysteria. Your young friend, Miss Baker, seems to be a highly hysterical subject. You know more than I do. Why, that's in the evidence, and you saw her yourself half crazy with emotion after the murder. Good Lord, said Reggie, Loma's old thing, you do run on. Panton time toils after you in vain. That girl wasn't crazy. She was the most natural of us all. You send a girl in her teens into the room where the woman she is keen on is sitting with her throat cut. She won't talk to you like a little lady. The evidence. Why do you believe what people tell you about people? They're always lying, by accident if not on purpose. This matron don't like the girl because she worshipped the lady doctor. Therefore, the girl is called abnormal and jealous. Did you never hear of a girl in her teens worshipping a teacher? It's common form. Did you never hear of another teacher being vicious about it? That's just as common. Do you mean the matron was jealous of them both? Reggie shrugged. It hit you in the eye. Good God, said Lomas. Do you suspect the matron? I suspect the devil, said Reggie gravely. Lomas, my child, whoever did that murder, cut the woman's throat and then sat down in her easy chair and watched her die. I call that devilish. And he told of the blood stains and the turned cushions. Good gad, said Lomas once more. There's some hate in that. Not a nice murder. Also, it stopped the children's party. You harp on that, Lomas looked at him curiously. Are you thinking of the visitors? I wonder, Reggie murmured. I wonder. Here's the list, Loma said, and Reggie came slowly to look. Sir George and Lady Bean, Lady Chantry, Mrs. Carraway, he ran his pencil down. All well-known, blameless busybodies, full of good works. Nothing doing. Crab Warnham, said Reggie. Oh, Warnham, his wife took him, I suppose. She's a saint, and he eats out of her hand, they say. Well, he was a loose fish, of course, but murder. I don't see Warnham at that. He has his eye for a woman. Still, I dare say. But look. But good God, you can't have known this lady doctor. Was she pretty? Reggie nodded. Well, we might look for a link between them. Not likely, is it? We're catching at straws, said Reggie somberly. Lomas pushed the papers away. Confound it, it's another case without evidence. I suppose it can't be suicide like that bigot affair. Reggie, who was lighting a cigar, looked up and let the match burn his fingers. Not suicide, no, he said. Was bigots? Well, it was a deuced queer death by misadventure. As you say, Reggie nodded and wandered dreamily out. This seems to have been the first time that anyone thought of comparing the bigot case to the orphanage murder. When the inquest on the lady doctor was held, the police had no more evidence to produce than you have heard, and the jury returned a verdict of murder by some person or persons unknown. Newspapers strove to enliven the dull calm of the holiday season by declaiming against the inefficiency of a police force which allowed murderers to remain anonymous, and hashed up the Bigod case again to prove that the fall of Sir Humphrey Bigod into his chalk pit, though called accidental, was just as mysterious as the cut throat of Dr. Hall, and the Honorable Sidney Lomas cursed the man who invented printing. These assaults certainly did not disturb Reggie Fortune, who has never cared what people say of him. With the help of Joan Amber, he found a quiet, remote place for the unhappy girl suspected of the murder. Lady Chantry was prettily angry with Miss Amber about that, protesting that she wanted to look after Edith herself, and said he was only in the case as a philanthropist, after which he gave all his time to preparing his house and Miss Amber for married life. But the lady found him dreamy. It was, in fact, while he was showing her how the new colors in the drawing-room looked under the new lighting that Dr. Eden called him up. Dr. Eden has a general practice in Kensington. Dr. Eden wanted to consult him about a case, most urgent, three King William's Walk. 
"'May I take the car?' said Reggie to Joan. "'He sounds rattled. You can go on home afterwards. It's not far from you, either. I wonder who lives at Three King William's Walk.' "'But it's Mrs. Warnham,' she cried. "'Oh, my aunt,' said Reggie Fortune, and said no more. And Joan Amber could not call him out of his thoughts. She was as grave as he. Only when he was getting out of the car, "'Be good to her, dear,' she said gently. He kissed the hand on his arm. The door was opened by a woman in evening dress. "'It is, Mr. Fortune, isn't it? Please come in. It's so kind of you to come.' She turned to the maid in the background. "'Tell Dr. Eden, Maggie. It's my little boy, and we are so anxious.' "'I'm very sorry, Mrs. Warnham.' Reggie took her hand and found it cold. The face he remembered for its gentle calm was sternly set. "'What is the trouble?' "'Gerald went to a party this afternoon. He came home gloriously happy and went to bed. He didn't go to sleep at once. He was rather excited, but he was quite well. Then he woke up crying with pain and was very sick. I sent for Dr. Eden. It isn't like Gerald to cry, Mr. Fortune, and—' A hoarse voice said, "'Catherine, you oughtn't to be out there in the cold.' Reggie saw the gaunt face of Captain Warnham looking round a door at them. "'What does it matter?' she cried. "'Dr. Eden doesn't want me to be with him, Mr. Fortune. He is still in pain, and I don't think Dr. Eden knows.' Dr. Eden came down in time to hear that. A large young man, he stood over them looking very awkward and uncomfortable. "'I'm sure Dr. Eden has done everything that can be done,' said Reggie gently. "'I'll go up, please.' And they left the mother to her husband, that flushed, gaunt face peering round the corner as they kept step on the stairs. "'The child's seven years old,' said Eden. "'There's no history of any gastric trouble. Rather a good digestion. And then this, out of the blue.' Reggie went into a nursery where a small boy lay huddled, and restless with all the apparatus of sickness by his bed. He raised a pale face on which beads of sweat stood. End of section 9 Recording by Nan Dodge